is something. Yes. But ah uh, yes, I can have to do it like this. Okay. okay. Yes, I have another. I have the iPad connected because I think at some point I will change to the iPad. Okay. So I see what you are seeing. So in, in, in case something goes wrong, uh, please do something so that I know that something went wrong on the other side. <laughs> okay. Right. okay, so we'll get okay, started. Um, so it's a pleasure to have Patricia Gonsalves speaking to us uh, this week. Um, just before we start, so the, the usual rules apply, which is um, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat. Uh, right now I'm going to turn off the ability for people to unmute themselves. Uh, so just put them in the chat and uh, either uh, somebody in the chat will answer them or we'll raise them to the speaker. At the end of the, of the talk, we'll allow everyone to unmute themselves and join together in applause. We can have some more questions before a quick break and then the second talk. Uh, so Patricia will be speaking to us about scaling limits for the symmetric exclusion with open boundaries. Uh, so take away. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much for this invitation. Hello to everybody. I only see Alessandra and Ivan on the screen, but I anyway, good afternoon to everybody. And um, so today I'm doing this, you know, Ivan, I told you that I had a problem. I had my daughter at home for 10 days. So I was not sure I was, was able to do the seminar. So I hope everything goes wrong, goes okay with the, with the connection. And I'm very happy to be here. So I'm going to, so I decided to, in fact, I changed the title of my talk. And um, I decided to talk about the scaling limits for the symmetric exclusion with open boundary. So before I go there, the goal of my talk is to talk about uh, non-equilibrium fluctuations. But you asked me to do a very pedagogical talk to be as simple as possible. And since the subject by itself, it's not an easy subject, I will try to do you know, all the path from zero to the result. So whenever something is not clear, or um, you know something I said is not completely obvious or something. Please interrupt me, okay? So this is a this is a work in fact that started I think six years ago uh, when I was working with Adriana. So I, I have to say, okay, my next slide. I hope, yeah, you see. So this is a work. Uh, in fact, it's a collection of works that I will talk about, and it has uh, all these people were involved. So Milton is here, but <laughs> okay, he was here, but it was with Milton, Milton Hara. You see here, it was with Tertuliano Franco, uh, Ottavio Menezes, and Adriana Neumann. So before going into the subject, uh, let me first try to explain where does this come from. So what do we want to do? What are the, what are the type of problems that we are investigating? So according to Boltzmann, this type of models that we are and the type of problems that we are looking at has to do with the, okay, I don't see my whole screen yet. Okay, but anyway, I can see here. So the idea is that we want to analyze the evolution of some fluids or some gas, but since the number of components is very big, there is no, and in fact, it's not what we want to do is to give a precise description of the microscopic state of the system, but the macroscopic state, that's what we want to know how it evolves. According to Boltzmann, the thing that we should start by doing is to look first at defining, at finding the equilibrium states of the system. And then I will formalize what I'm saying here mathematically. We should characterize these states by some macroscopic quantities like pressure, the temperature or density. In the models that I will look at, we will be talking about the density. And then after this, we do the analysis of the system out of equilibrium. And this is quite challenging. So I will tell you today, how to look at a system for which we are interested in looking at the evolution of the density and trying to see how it evolves out of equilibrium. Okay, so what, okay, so the, the idea is the following. We have a volume, let's say lambda. Let me use this, I'm not sure you can, ah, yes, you can see. There is this volume lambda and we try to discretize this volume where is our gas evolving according to a parameter n and we are going to this to get a discrete set of points so let me call it lambda n and at some point i will say in my case what is lambda n and we're going to have two scales one for space another one for time so basically we're going to make a, a um, we're going to consider a mesh which is going to be let's say if you think about the interval zero one for example we're going to split it into c uh, intervals of size one over n so there was there will be a um, let's say a, a scaling for space, which means that if we want to see some kind of evolution, we're gonna to have to speed up the time according to a function of n. And this will be, I will explain later what it is in my case. So in each place, what we do in each, let's say in each place of the discrete set, we put a number of particles, let's say a random number of particles. And then we assume that the dynamics is conserving some quantity. It can be one, one quantity. So in my case, in my models, 
that I will be describing today, I will have only one conserved quantity, but which at some point I will put boundary, I mean, um, a dynamics on the reservoir. So this conserved quantity, in fact, it's gonna be destroyed. But in the case of Cedric, so Cedric later will be discussing the equilibrium fluctuations for models, which have more than one conserved quantity. Anyway, so the models are, uh, so that this will be continuous time Markov processes. So this means that the waiting times are given by independent Poisson processes. So we have this, this property of the memory loss. So the idea is like this, you have this, so on the left hand side now of my screen, you have here, a, let's say a volume V or Lambda. And you, the, the thing is, first thing to do is we have to find the stationary states of the system, these invariant states and Suppose that we did the job according to Boltzmann, we found them, we characterize this state by a quantity, let's say a rho. In my case, rho will be telling me how the density evolves. And then we say, I look at, so at initial time, I fix a position u, I, I, I look at the neighborhood around this point u, and I, this, this system, due to the interaction between particles, the system is equilibrated, it is in equilibrium. So this equilibrium now is parameterized by this quantity, let's say rho of v, which depends on the point u, but this is a time zero. You let the system evolve and you ask exactly the same questions. I fix the point U, I look at the, uh, I, I assume that the system is locally in an equilibrium, but now this equilibrium depends on two quantities, the row T, which depends on T and depends on U. So the question is, what is the macroscopic law that describes the evolution of the conserved quantity of the system? So rho is a solution of what? So let's see before I go on. So let us suppose that my state I have the microscopic, so the discrete space is the space lambda n with this point. So let's say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And now we want to fix the initial condition for the system. So suppose we do the following. You toss a coin, and if you get heads or tails, you put a particle or not. So suppose you do this, and you have this outcome. Let's say you put a particle at 0, no particle at 1, and so on. So then, so this, is, this fixed the initial condition of the system. And now suppose that I give you the following. Okay, now you have two pictures, one on the left hand side and another one on the right hand side. So the right hand side, you have 15 configurations. So I'll try to explain what this is. So the left hand side, the initial condition is here. You can see my mouse. So you have these three particles that we have as an outcome of tossing the coin. And then between every two, let's say in every set of points of the form x, x plus one, I put an arrow going down, which is representing time. So here you see, for example, between the site zero and the site one, there is this arrow here and you see some marks, right? Some crosses. And you see the same thing between site one and two, two and three and so on. So at this moment, I'm gonna tell you what is the dynamics that I'm gonna assume for this model. So here is just marks. So realizations of independent Poisson processes, which are attached to the bonds, to, to the bonds, uh, let's say x, x plus one. So the idea, once I give you the initial configuration and all these marks of these Poisson processes, we can recover the whole process, the evolution of the whole process. So, okay, on the right hand side, this is a continuous time mark of process. So on the right hand side, what I did is that I put all the configurations that we see every time there is a mark. So in fact, this indexing on the right hand side has to do with the number of marks. So let's see what happens. For example, when we go down in time, the first mark we see is this one here, right? Between the site, so zero, one, two, and three, right? So since, so since we see a mark of this Poisson process, this means that there is a jump and this particle is going to go to the right side, okay? So when we look at the right hand side, this is exactly what happens. So this means that the difference between the configuration eta zero and eta one is just that this particle went down. Then we do the following, we continue to look as time goes down. So the next mark we see is this mark over here. So this means that, okay, I don't see my screen, but the next configuration, what's going to happen is that the particle that was here is going to swap to this position here. And you continue to do this. Okay, is it clear what I'm doing? So on the right hand side, we just index the number of configuration by the number of marks. And it doesn't mean that every time I see a mark, there will be a change. For example, if you have two particles together, since we do not distinguish the particles here, even if they swap, you see exactly the same configuration. So at some point in my screen here, for example, if you look at eta nine and eta 10, nothing happens. There was a mark of Poisson processes, particle swap, but the configuration is exactly the same. Okay, so this I'm saying that the process what is doing is just it's just particles are just jumping to nearest neighbors. In fact, this could be much more general, but the picture would be a mess because in fact, it could allow long jumps or even more complicated dynamics. But just to give you a very simple example, 
So let me just go a little bit, uh, and uh, which is called the exclusion process, which is, the in fact, the model that I will consider. I will talk a little bit about the zero range, which is a model that Cedric will discuss later. So let's try to formalize this. So every time you see this clock here, this clock doesn't mean anything. Just the, so in the picture, just means that there is probably a mark of a Poisson process. So sometimes we'll see an arrow, which means that the particle will be able to do a jump. So what is the, the so how do we what do we have here? It's n is going to be this a scaling parameter. We have a space, a microscopic space where there is this uh, discrete space where particles are going to jump around. So it's going to be our random process. There is a continuous space where I'm going to try to uh, uh, extract some solutions of PDEs or stochastic PDEs, which will be a continuous space. The time, there will be two scales for time, a macroscopic time, which is going to be of the form T times theta n, and theta n we'll discuss later what it can be, and the macroscopic time will be denoted by T. So we have independent Poisson processes which are telling me what is the time between uh, jumps. There is a transition probability that before in the previous slide was just P1 equal to, so let's say P1 equal to P of minus one equal to a half. So symmetric simple exclusion, if you think, but it could be in fact more general, it can allow long jumps. So eta T of N will denote the number of particles at the position X at the time T N square, the microscopic time T N square. So we have Markov processes in continuous time. And let us suppose that now the density is conserved. So particles are just moving around. We do not create nor annihilate particles yet. So what happens in the exclusion process? So for example, after a ring of a clock, a particle jumps from a size X, and now I'm, along, I'm allowing uh, long jumps. So it jumps to X from X to Y with a rate P Y minus X. So the rate depends only on the size of the jump. So for example, so let me see if you can see because I have a screen and I don't see, yeah. So for example, imagine that here, there is these arrows that you can see in red. So this means that there is a mark of a Poisson process between this position and this position here and the particle. So there is nothing in the destination point. So the particle can jump and jumps with probability P2, whatever is my P2. So this happens after the ring of the clock. But if this thing happened, what we say is that the jump is not allowed. Or if we think that it is allowed, but particles just swap positions, but we don't see anything because we don't distinguish particles, we say that the jump is not allowed. So this is the exclusion rule. Particles can only jump if the position where they jump is, is empty. OK, two clocks don't ring at the same time, or they do, but with probability 0. So we, we neglect these events. And another model, which is very, uh, which is the one that Cedric is going to discuss later, and it's very classical in the theory of particle systems, is the zero range process. So the difference now is that we no longer have at most one particle per site, and we can have any number of particles per site. There is again this transition probability p here, which uh, tells me uh, with which intensity we can go from x to y, and there is this rate here g. I'm sure you can. I'm not sure. Yes, you can see this g of eta x. So this is the y. The, the process has a name zero range, which means that you jump from x to y with probability p y minus x times the function g looks, let's say, the function g applied to the evaluated at the position eta of x. So it depends on the number of particles of where the of the position where the particle is departing. Let's say it doesn't depend. So g does only depends on eta of x. Okay. So what happens here? So if this, if, okay, if there is this mark of the Poisson process here, it means that one of these particles is going to jump, for example, to this position, it can jump with probability P minus three times G of three with this rate, let's say. Okay, this is what happens after. And the same thing here can go to the right with this rate. So these are the two classical interacting particle systems. I will discuss the first one, Cedric will discuss the later, but in which, in my case, I will only have one conserved quantity. In the case of Cedric, you will look at two conserved quantities. Okay, so this is what happens. So let me try to see what kind of questions we can ask about this type of models. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna show you two simulations on the torus. So at some point you will see particles going to the right or to the left, but they will appear on the other side because we are in, with periodic uh, conditions. And the difference between left and right, so left displays and right displays, is that here the initial configuration is like this. So let me try to explain. So I put here, let's say, 90 sites. Position zero, there are zero particles. At position one, there is one particle. At position two, there are two and three and so on. Is it clear what I'm doing? What does it mean, these, uh, these uh, uh, black lines? Yeah, so for example, here at 20, I put 20 particles. In 21, I put 19 and so on. 
So the difference from here to here is the initial, so left to right is the initial configuration. So in the right, I have zero particles between zero and 20, and from 31 to 50. And in the middle, I have the same number of particles, let's say 100. So it's like I'm starting my initial condition with an indicator function, let's say like, and, but multiply by, by 100 in this case. So difference between upper displays and lower displays is the rate. So for example, if you see here, I say that above in the upper displays, I have symmetric rates. So probability one half, one half to the left and right. But in the lower displays, it's 0, 9 to the right and 0, 1 to the left. So this means that there will be a preference to go to the right. So let's see what happens. So, um, so now we are seeing the same initial configuration, but with two different, uh, so symmetric rates above and asymmetric rates below. And here on the right-hand side, so let me just see if I can do this at the same time. Uh, so here you see the same, so symmetric rates above and asymmetric rates below. Okay, you will see the particles coming in to the, to the left. So what we are going to try to first to explain is what is called the hydrodynamic limit, which means I'm gonna to try to find a solution of a PDE, which is approximating this density of particles. So, oops, so what is the goal? So then I will explain what happens in my model, but the goal would be to show that if you define the empirical measure, which is this measure, which is here. So it's a measure, which is random. There is the eta here, which is the configuration that uh, um, that we are seeing at time t. So you take this random measure, which gives weight one over n every time I see a particle. So in the case of exclusion process, the eta of x is either zero or one. So this measure just gives weight one over n every time I see a particle. And it's a sum of Dirac measures. So there is a delta here, which is a Dirac measure, uh, which, uh, which is a Dirac measure in the continuous space x over n. So don't forget there is the x which is living in the discrete space, which corresponds to x over n in the continuous space. And the goal is to show that this measure, let's say this trajectory of measure, so this is a random measure which depends on time, it is converging in some sense that I will explain later to a measure which is to a trajectory of measures which is uh, deterministic and the density, it's absolutely continuous with respect to the Dovec measure and the density solution in some sense to a PDE. So we want to find what is the PDE depending on the type of the dynamics that we consider There are different PDEs that we can get. So let me put here the simulations. So these are exactly the same simulations we have seen before in the symmetric case. And in red, what you have is the solution to the, hydrodynamic, to the corresponding hydrodynamic equation. So for example, we can get uh, from these particle systems, different PDEs. I, I have a list of four here. For example, the heat equation when we consider P symmetric, so one half, one half, and you take time scale of order T and square. Porous medium equation, now it's a nonlinear PDE. You have here Laplacian, for example, of rho square. Again, there is a choice for the rates to get to this equation. The inviscid burgers or the fractional heat equation, but here the time scale has to be a bit, uh, in these two last cases, the time scale has to be a little bit different in order to get these equations. But this is just to give an idea of what kind of problems we can get with these systems. And then I will explain to you what happens exactly in my model. So what about fluctuations? So now what we have is a kind of law of large numbers for the empirical measure. If you want to see what is the uh, fluctuations, which is the, in fact the goal of my talk. So now what we do is to define this functional. So let me call it YNT, which, um, so it's a functional, which is defined in a proper space, I would explain later. And every time I see a test function F, what I define here on the right-hand side is just the integral of F with respect to the empirical measure. I remove the mean. Here I am consider considering the initial measure as a Bernoulli product measure with constant parameter rho. And I take the CLT scaling. And the question is, where does this converge? In which sense? We will see. And yt, so yNT, this field is going to converge to a solution, a solution to a stochastic partial differential equation. And uh, there are some examples here. You can see, for example, the ornstein hulenbeck or the stochastic burgers equation or the fractional stochastic burgers equation. So the idea is that, so for example, here in the simulation, what we want to see is that you have the particle system with 100 particles everywhere, a constant solution. And here is just the difference between the random uh, evolution and the constant solution. So this is what we want to analyze. How does these fluctuations evolve? And what are the form of these fluctuations? So for my, can I, can I go on or is it clear what I, what is the, so this is the typical problems that when that we usually study in particle systems, hydrodynamic limits and fluctuations. And what I will try to explain to you is one particular model which has boundary conditions. 
and try to get the result, this result that I'm, I'm showing here on the slide, not starting from the stationary measure, but starting from the equilibrium measure, but starting from a general initial conditions of measures, measures which are more general than the, the initial, the invariant measure. Is it clear what I'm gonna do? Is any question? Yes, it's fine. Okay, so in my talk, uh, I will consider a model and first I will review the hydrodynamic limit, then I will jump to the fluctuations. And it's gonna be a model which is in contact with reservoirs. So the density will no longer be a conserved quantity. And I want to analyze what is the impact of having these dynamics at the reservoirs at the level of the PDE. And jumps here are nearest neighbors. And then I will explain at the end what, what, what we know about, uh, let's say, uh, in, in the case where jumps are not the nearest neighbors. So the macroscopic space will be the interval 0, 1. The discrete space will be this space, this space here, lambda n, just a set of points 1, 2, 3, etc., up to n minus 1. So the, the exclusion process, I'm going to consider an exclusion process, which means that we have a Markov process with state space uh, 0, 1 to the lambda n. So just uh, at each position, we either have a particle or not. And when we say that eta x is equal to one, we say that there is a particle at the position x. And the goal is to present non-equilibrium fluctuations. Before that, what do we know about hydrodynamic limits? So let's first define properly the model. So here you see, yes, you can see. So, okay, so what this picture means, I distinguished colors. So the, I distinguished the, the particles with different colors. So there are, but in fact, these colors at the right side just mean that there is a reservoir. So in fact, if you see from here, you can see, this is the position one, position two, and this is the position n minus one. So the, the, the particles in brown, they just want to, uh, let's say, to mimic a reservoir, to represent a reservoir. So there is a reservoir at the left hand side another reservoir at the right hand side. And now let's define the rates. So in the bulk, so in the set of points from one to n minus one, particles just go to the right or left with probability a half. So what is the, the dynamics at the reservoirs? The reservoirs only act in the first position. So for example, the left reservoir only acts in the first site and it injects particles to the system if this position is open. So there is, there is, it's empty. So if there is nothing here and the rate to get in is given by this. Okay, there is a bunch of parameters. I will explain later the role of each one of them. But here there is a kappa, there is an alpha. Okay, there is a two because I want this to be uh, coherent with the bulk dynamics, which is one half, one half. And there is a theta here. On the so they enter with this rate and to get out. So if there is a particle here, it can get out to the reservoir with the rate K kappa times one minus alpha over two and theta. So on the right side, the rate to get in, you just replace the alpha with beta, which can be different from alpha. And to get out, the rate is just k, one minus beta over two and theta. So what is the role of this? So alpha and beta means that what they are doing, so suppose, for example, that beta is equal to one and alpha is equal to zero. So this means that particles are just coming from the right side and leaving from the left side. So alpha and beta, what they are doing is that they are inducing a current of particles in the system. So this is, the, let's say, the power of the reservoirs. And one, okay, this is the role of alpha and beta. So if I want them to be different, they are, in, they are creating this, this flux of particles through the system. So the role of theta is that the higher, let's say the higher but positive theta uh, that it is, as higher it is, it means that I'm slowing down the, the impact of the reservoirs in the system. So as, as theta increases, they are slower. But if theta is negative, it means that I am speeding the dynamics of the reservoirs. So that is the role of theta, to try to speed or slow the, slower the dynamics of the reservoirs. And the kappa has to do with the following. There will be one regime in which the PDEs will depend on kappa. And if you want to analyze what happens to the solution of the PDE when you take different values of kappa, for example, kappa going to zero and kappa to infinity, you can recover the two other uh, solutions that you get in the other regimes. I, I think this will be clear maybe later. So for now, forget the role of kappa, but there is a role of kappa. It will only appear in one case in the, at, the, at the PDE level. Okay, so what is the dynamic? So as I said, so suppose here there is the clock ringing. So there is a mark of a Poisson process. So this is what happens. A particle goes here. 
if we want, uh, if there is a mark, so there is a mark of a Poisson process close to the boundary, so we see now at position one, this means that the particle can get in and it gets in, it has this. Uh, so now you see the colors, they don't, don't make any role. And the same thing from the right, they can get in, so this is what happens. Okay, so this is the dynamics, and in the bulk, they just jump to nearest neighbors in the positions uh, where they go, it's, they are empty. So the goal is to analyze what happens at the level of the macroscopic behavior of the system when I change this parameter theta. But before going there, so as if I increase a lot theta or if I, if I make it very positive and very big or very negative and very big, what happens? So before going that, let me just formalize what do I mean, what is the generator of this process? So I try to write not very ugly formulas on slides because it's you no, know, it's very difficult to follow a talk by Zoom, but uh, I think I need to put this generator, at least try to explain what, what happens. So let's say I have my space, let I call ball, which is a set of points from one to n minus one. I have the process I denoted by eta t, and eta t of x is just the number of particles of x, either zero or one. The infinitesimal generator is going to have two parts, one which represents the exchange dynamics in the bulk, another one so that I called ln of zero here. There is another one which is the dynamics from the reservoirs, so I'm going to put the two together, the left dynamics and the right dynamics. So the generator in the bulk is like this, so every time you have a particle, so okay, so what does it mean the eta x x plus one? So the eta is just a configuration of uh, with zeros and ones. Eta x eta x plus one means that I swap the variables eta x and eta x plus one, which corresponds to, let's say, to a jump between uh, the position x and x plus one. So this is the dynamics in the bulk. In fact, to be really precise, according to my pictures, there should be a one over two here, but I didn't want to put because otherwise I, my, 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 there will be a bunch of constants that will appear. So all my results are okay conditioned to missing this constant one over two, okay? But it's the same, I mean, it doesn't change so much. For the dynamics in the bulk, in the boundary, what happens? So the, dynam the generator is like this. So you see here there is X, for example, X equal to one. So this means that there is a rate to get in, which was this alpha K over two N theta, which is represented here. So this R X, oops, sorry, I cannot see. No, what happens? Yeah, so there is an R X, which can be either alpha or beta, depending if X is equal to one or N minus one. And this configuration here, eta to the x, means that I'm flipping the value of the configuration at the position x. So if it is one, it means that eta x is gonna be zero, okay? So this is the two different uh, generators, one for the bulk dynamics, which is the exchange dynamics, and another one in the boundary, which, is, which creates and annihilates. So this is a, a, a global dynamics, this one here, okay? Is it clear? Everything is okay up to here, yeah? Okay, so let's go. So the first question that we have to find, the first thing we should do is to find, is to try to find the invariant measures. In fact, what I'm gonna do is not important to know the invariant measures, but it's something that we can compute explicitly in the case alpha equal to beta. So suppose that the impact, so the rates to get in and out from left and right, they are equal. So alpha equal to beta equal to rho. The Bernoulli product measures, they are invariant and in fact, they are reversible. So this is what usually are called equilibrium measures. Equilibrium because this means that the, the reservoirs, they are not create, they are creating the same impact. So there is, no, there is not this current of particles which is being induced by the reservoirs because they induce exactly the same strength, let's say. When alpha is different from beta, the, okay, we know that there exists a unique invariant measure, a unique stationary measure, because we, are, uh, we have a, a finite state Markov chain, which is irreducible. And we call it, let's denote it by mu SS, but we have no information about this measure. In fact, there is a method which is called the matrix, matrix and sats uh, product, which allows to get some information about this measure in the case, in the, in the exact model that I'm showing to you. But it's very, I mean, it's restrict, restrictive. So for example, when you want to do the same thing with long jumps for which at the end I can comment a bit on what, on what we know, uh, this method doesn't give us any information about the stationary measure. So I will try not to use uh, the information about this measure, nevertheless it exists and let me denote it by mu SS. Okay, so now what about hydrodynamics? So in the hydrodynamic limit, what we want to show is uh, uh, the convergence of this random, this, this trajectory of measures, which are given by this. So you can see here on top, this empirical measure. So here I'm gonna speed up the time by N square and I will explain later why I did this. 
So here, when you see the eta tn square, is because I need somehow to speed up the time to see something which is non-trivial, and the scaling in this case is this one. And the starting point, so we have, some, we have to assume something from the initial measure of the system. So let me call it mu n, the initial distribution of eta zero. So the distribution of eta zero. And I say the following, assume that this measure has the following, satisfies the following property. This is what we usually, we call it to be associated to a function. So here you see uh, it's written mu n being associated to G. What means this? It means that I fix a function G from zero one, so my marker space zero one to zero one, which is measurable, just measurable. And I assume that under mu n, under the measure mu n, this quantity here, so let's think about what is this quantity here on the left hand side. It is just the integral of a test function h with respect to the empirical measure. Okay, so if I integrate a function h with respect to this measure, since this is a sum of Dirac measures, this is exactly what I get. Okay, so on the left hand side, it's the integral of h with respect to, to the measure p n zero, it's time zero. And what we are saying is that this integral is converging to the integral of h with respect to this measure, um, to this deterministic measure, gq dq. So this is a, let's say, this is a weak convergence of measures, but since these measures are random, I have to say in which sense with respect to the randomness. So let's suppose that this convergence is true with respect to mu n, okay? And this is what is called mu n being associated to g. So if this is true, if we start from a measure like this, which has this property, what we have to prove in the hydrodynamic limit is that in fact, this is true for any time t. So whenever you take a t bigger than zero, the same result is true. You have the weak convergence of the measure pi and t to a measure which is deterministic and the density is solution to a PDE, which is the hydrodynamic equation, okay? So what is the PDE? So let's see. So let me try to, okay, this, this, this is the result, this is the theorem, but the result is like this. Okay, maybe it's better to put it in the next slide. You have three different PDEs. So the, the impact of the reservoir dynamics, since it is just on the set, the points one and then minus one, the nature of the PDE is exactly the same as, you could, as if you were considering, for example, the exclusion process on the torus. So it's the heat equation. But since we have now a boundary dynamics, which depends on this, uh, I mean, depend, depends on a bunch of parameters, k, alpha, beta, and theta, but three PD, I get three PDEs with three, I get one PDE with three different boundary conditions. So when theta is bigger than one, which means that the reservoirs are very, very slow, we get a heat equation with Neumann boundary conditions. Okay, one thing, this result was not proved by me, as you can see on the previous slide, this is a result from Baldasso and other co-authors, Otavio, Adriana, and another, another um, and Rodrigo. So what they got is that, depending on the value of theta, you get three different regimes, always the heat equation, but when the reservoirs are very slow, so when theta is very big, you get Neumann boundary conditions, so the derivatives, spatial derivatives at zero and one are zero. For theta very negative, actually theta less than one, you get Dirichlet boundary conditions. The profile is fixed as being alpha and beta at the boundaries. And in one case, so theta equal to one, you get Robin boundary conditions for which you see the value of kappa. This, this kappa that I mentioned in the beginning that was in the microscopic level, and it was only appearing at the macroscopic level in one regime, it's exactly this. So the rule of kappa, it's not uh, important for what I'm gonna do later. In fact, I'm gonna take kappa equal to one in what comes next is just because, for example, you want to study what happens at the weak solution of this equation here. And if you want to take kappa to zero or kappa to infinity, when you take kappa to zero, you can recover, well, what you expect, the heat equation with Neumann boundary conditions. And when you take kappa to infinity, you can recover the um, weak solution of the heat equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions. So that's just the role of kappa. And sometimes it can give us an intuition if we don't know what happens in the other regimes of theta, this, this, this uh, looking at this equation with the kappa can give us some intuition of what kind of boundary conditions we expect, which sometimes are not easy to derive from the particle system. So this is the hydrodynamic limit. Is it, uh, is it uh, clear? Yes, so three different PDs. But uh, okay, one question is the following. I'm saying that I am assuming that I start from a sequence of measures. So in all these results that I'm, I know in this result that I'm showing you, I am assuming that the measure mu n is associated to a function g. 
And if this is true, then the result goes. So the question is, for example, what about the stationary measure? Is it true that this result also includes the stationary measure? So we should be able to show that the stationary measure is associated in that sense to some function. What is the candidate? The stationary solution of this PD, right? And that is what is called the hydrostatic limit. And this was also proved by these people who proved the hydrodynamic limit, that in fact, if you start from the stationary measure, uh, you prove that, you can prove that it is associated to a profile, which is, I call it a row bar, which is in fact the stationary solution of, of those equations, which are very simple. It's just a linear because it's the heat equation. You are finding the stationary solution of the heat equation with different boundary conditions. So row bar is written here, okay? Of, of course, in Neumann, for example, any constant is a stationary solution, but the system picks exactly this solution alpha plus beta over two, okay? So let's say the, the minimum between the action of the reservoirs at the left hand. Okay, so it's clear up to here. So hydrodynamics also includes the stationary measure. And we have again, the hydrodynamic limit starting from the stationary measure, whatever it is. Can I go on? Is it clear? Is it okay? Okay, I don't have much time, 20 minutes. Okay, so what about fluctuations? What do we know for the fluctuations? So I will try first to fix in the, uh, to, to, um, to focus on the case t equal to one, the Robin case. So don't forget we have this picture here. We have d clay for theta less than one. Neumann for theta bigger than one and Robin, linear Robin for theta equal to one. If I have time at the end, I can tell you um, lots of problems that I don't know how to solve and some of some that I know how to solve. We can make a short discussion on this, but now just, just think about the Robin case, okay? So theta equal to one and let's put cap equal to one so there are no extra parameters. So what do we know? Okay, now we have to define the functional. Uh, so this functional, which is written here at, at the bottom of the page. So this function has to be defined for a proper space of test functions. And okay, I wrote here all of them, but you can just fix on number two. So the functions that I will consider here, they will have to have some kind of Robin boundary conditions. But in fact, I have to ask more. So if you look at this point number two, for t equal to one, I have to define this functional y living in a space that we called S theta. So with all these functions here, they have, uh, they belong to the space S theta. What is S theta? Is the space of functions which are C infinity in zero one and have, for example, in the Robin case, they have these boundary conditions. All the, okay, I never know even or odd, 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 right? <laughs> all the other derivatives at zero they coincide with the even. So think about k equal to k equal to zero, for example. So k equal to zero, this is telling me that the derivative at h at zero is h at zero. And the derivative of h at one is minus, the minus h at one. So what is this? Let's compare these to the PDE. So let me just go back. So if you come here at the PDE and you take alpha, equal, alpha and beta equal to zero and k equal to one, it's exactly the same boundary conditions, okay? So basically we're taking the homogeneous version of the, of the boundary conditions of the PD, we are transposing them to define the, the fluctuation field. So we give this definition here. Okay, for the Dirichlet and Neumann is not so difficult, but okay, let me explain. So for example, for Dirichlet, it's this case here, theta less than one, means that we are just imposing the functions. So H at zero and H one to be zero, but the second derivative also satisfy the same condition, the fourth derivative and so on. And for Neumann, it's the other way around. You assume that the first derivative is zero at zero and one, the third derivative is zero at, and so on, okay? So we have this space of test functions and let's see what is the role of this space. Why am I defining this, this, uh, this space of test functions? So let's fix Robin. So the derivative of h at zero is h of zero and in one is minus. So we define the, the ah, okay, one important thing. There is a difference between I'm, what this functional that I'm defining here and the one that I defined before, because before, when I gave the general uh, description about hydrodynamics and fluctuations, I mentioned the case where you take the Bernoulli, the Bernoulli with constant profile, but here I don't take the Bernoulli. I here, I center the variable. So you see here the eta of x, and I am centering eta of x with respect to its expectation but starting from any measure. So here there is the expectation with respect to mu n, whatever is mu n, okay? If mu n was the invariant measure, so alpha equal to beta equal to rho, here I would put just rho, 
Okay, is it clear? So here I'm saying that I start from any measure and I am centering the variables with respect to that measure. Okay, so this is the density field. And now, okay, there are some operators to define. So maybe I skip this slide, it's, it's simple, but it's just that I have to define the Laplacian and the derivative operators on the space of test functions, on the corresponding space of test functions. So when we are on the bulk, I mean, in the interval zero one is just the usual Laplacian, but when you are at zero, you have to define the Laplacian from the right and or in one, the Laplacian from the left and so on. But just think of this as the usual Laplacian and derivative operator, but defined on this new space of test functions with the boundary conditions. Okay, TT, there is a notation which will appear later. TT is just a semi-group associated to each one of the PDEs, so with the different boundary conditions, but when I take homogeneous boundary conditions, so alpha equal to beta equal to zero, okay? So let's fix t equal to one, the Robin case. And what do I need to assume to derive the, um, the non-equilibrium fluctuations? So I say that, so remember the condition for hydrodynamics was that we need to have a measure mu n, which is associated to a profile. And the profile is something which is general. So let me call it here rho zero, some profile from zero one to zero one, which is measurable. And this is exactly the same condition that we had in hydrodynamics before. So I still assume that condition, okay? Mu n is associated to a profile. Then I define this quantity here. So let me give a name to the expectation of eta x, eta t of x with respect to the measure mu n. So I call it this function. Okay, here it's a time zero, but later it will be at time t, but doesn't matter. So rho n zero is just the expectation of eta zero x, okay? And we need to have this. So the maximum between the maximum at x, x is in the set of points one to n minus one. Of this, the difference between this function rho n zero and rho zero has to go to, so the difference has to go to zero in the order one over n, okay? And one thing extra that we need to have is this. If I look at the initial correlations, so let me call phi n zero x y, the correlations between the site uh, eta x, the occupation variables eta x and eta y. So what is this is the usual, it's the expectation of eta x minus its mean times eta y minus its mean, which you can write like this. And what we need to assume is that the correlations at the initial time, so this is for the initial time here, time is zero, okay? They have to go to zero with this rate, one over n. If we have this, so let me tell you what we can prove, okay? Is it clear these conditions? Is it okay? So we start from a measure which has, which is associated to a profile, like in the hydrodynamics, but we need that profile. We need that when we start from that measure, let's say what we call the discrete profile, which is this guy over here, is close to the profile for which the measure is associated and correlations have to go to zero. Okay, so one thing you can ask me is, is are, are there measures in these conditions? So if you take, for example, mu n, initial measure as being the Bernoulli product measure with this form. So eta x, the eta x are independent, it's product. And each eta x has Bernoulli distribution with parameter rho zero at x over n. Then this is true, it's product. So correlations are zero. And you have immediately that this condition is true. Okay, this is zero. So this is one possible measure for which we can start to the theorem from. And another question is, well, does the stationary measure satisfy this condition, right? Does the stationary measure satisfy this too? Uh, okay, it's associated to profile, it's true. We have seen that in the hydrodynamic limit, but is it true that the correlations go to zero in this, with this order? This is something also that it's also true. Okay, but what is, the, what is the result? And maybe how much time do I have? Okay, I don't have much time, but let me try to tell you what is the tricky part in the proof. So what is the result first? So the result is like this. If you, okay, so don't forget, there was a yn, the functional, which is which was written here. Okay, let, yeah, it was written here. So we can prove that the functional is tight. Okay, let me just go a little. And all the limiting points, they satisfy this equality here. So yt at h is y0 evaluated at TTH. So TTH is just a semi-group of the Robin, of the heat equation with Robin boundary conditions with homogeneous conditions. So alpha equal to beta equal to beta. So you have YTH equal to this initial field evaluated at TTH plus WTH. WTH is just a mean zero Gaussian random variable. Okay, there is a certain variance that I didn't write because it's a huge formula, but basically it's like 
you have uh, um, you have let's say the the L two norm of the gradient of the semi group applied in H, but an L two norm which has a weight that sees the boundaries. So it's an L2, it's an L2 space given by a Lebesgue measure with two Dirac measures at zero and one, which somehow see the effect of the boundary conditions. Okay, so this is, uh, so this doesn't prove convergence. We have tightness and we know that limiting points satisfy this identity. But if you have convergence at initial time, so suppose that the Y and zero converges initially to some Gaussian uh, field Y0 with a certain covariance that I wrote here with the sigma HG, then in fact the convergence is true and the limit is an ornstein hullenbeck process which has a certain covariance that you can see written over here. So let me try to explain to you what is the difficulty in trying to prove this result. But again, you could ask me, okay, you know how to prove this for these general measures, you know tightness and you identify the limit points. You know how to prove this if you have initial convergence at initial time, but what about the stationary measure? Can you prove this for the stationary measure? Yes, because the, the stationary measure satisfies the conditions that we impose. And the result that we get is exactly what is written here. Okay, I don't spend much time on this, but it's true that you can also derive non-equilibrium fluctuations starting from the stationary measure. Okay, what is the difficult part in this result? So the first thing you have one, well, one has to do is this, you have to somehow, let's say, apply the Inkins formula and try to see a martingale problem for the solution of your stochastic uh, uh, partial differential equation. So when we apply Dinkins formula, you can see here uh, this first line in my, my slide, there is this martingale here, there is the initial, the initial uh, let's say the field at the time uh, yt, the initial field y0 and here there is an integral in time and here is where we see the impact of the dynamics because here you have to apply the generator to the field at time s okay when we do this because our generator has two parts a part which has an impact in the bulk another part which has an impact in the boundaries so when you do these and you do the computations okay i just put the result here this is t equal to one and then i will explain for the different one one is more complicated but for theta equal to one, you see here what you get. So this guy is equal to, there are three terms. So this first term is exactly the field applied in the Laplacian of H, the discrete Laplacian of H. And D, it is here, for example, where you see the impact of choosing the, the time scale as being N squared. Because if I put here something which is less than N squared, you don't see nothing in the evolution, everything goes to zero. If I put something bigger than N squared, these guys blow up. So this is the correct scaling, the n square, in order to see some discrete operator, which here is the discrete Laplacian, which is going to converge to the real Laplacian. But here there are two terms. You see here uh, um, one term here, so the second term and the third term in, the, in this uh, display. And this has to do with the boundary conditions. So let's see if I'm able, which we are because our functions are C infinity, so if you replace this discrete derivative by the continuous derivative, what you have here is just the h prime at zero. And here you would have h at zero. And this is why this case is simple because you have boundary conditions on the test functions which allow you to kill these terms immediately. Because this function, he, so this, this, uh, the, the space of test functions that I am defining the functional is such that, so let me just go back a little bit. Uh, where is my space? Ah, it is here. So for example, k equal to zero, you see here that the derivative of h at zero is h at zero. And the derivative of h at one is minus h at one. So when you use this space of test functions, this allows you to kill these terms. Okay, but oops, I was, it allows you to kill these two terms. So you can immediately close the, the equation. So you can simply replace this guy by the field applied in the Laplacian of h plus some terms that go to zero in n and you close the equation easily, okay? Is it, is it okay? Can I continue? Yes, okay. Okay, what is the difficult thing is correlations. So what do, what do, we, what do we need to prove about the correlation? So if you remember, I had the condition on the initial measure, which was imposing that the correlations at time zero would have to go to zero with the, with the rate one over n. And why is that important? Because in the middle of, I mean, we, it's not only that you need to control the initial, for, the initial correlations, but you need to show that in fact, that bound propagates in time. 
And this is what this proposition is saying is that if initially, so it's what is written here. Okay, so this is, uh, okay, this is exactly the same notation as we have seen before. You define now the correlation function. So before I define it at time zero, now I define it at the time t. So what is that? Phi and t x y, the correlations between the occupation at eta x and eta y is just the usual thing, the expectation of eta x minus its average, but don't forget it's its average with respect to the measure mu n. So it's this guy here, the row n t x times the same thing with y. This function, okay, it's something which is important. It's a function which is symmetric in the variables x and y. If you just replace x by y, it's the same story. And so it's a function defined on this space Vn. Okay, I'm not sure it's clear, but Vn is like a triangle in which you erase the diagonal. Why do we erase the diagonal? So it's symmetric so that we don't consider the whole square, just consider, for example, the upper triangle. And on the diagonal, if you replace here y equal to x, since eta x squared is exactly eta x, what you get here is a function of rho x, rho and dx. So you are in fact, so you know what the, how this behaves. So what you are interested in is in fact what happens above the diagonal, okay? So we define this function in this way. And for example, for the, I wrote here, there are two things, which is x equal to zero. So what is x equal to zero? So we give a convention that this guy is alpha and this guy is also alpha. So it means that this function is zero. So this is a function defined on the triangle which is zero if you think about this as a triangle and these are the, cate the catheters, the catheters. So you can think of this as being zero on the catheters, okay? So this function, the, the, the difficult part is to prove the following result. For this function, if you assume that at time zero, it goes to, so it, it satisfies this bound. So the maximum for X and Y in this triangle of this function is of order one over N, the same thing is true for any time T. Okay, so you get exactly the same thing. Okay, so this is the hard part. I will hope to have time to explain to you, maybe not. Okay, what should I do? Um, okay, let me just explain what is the difficulty with theta different from one, because you saw, very, you saw that it was very special, these boundary conditions allows us immediately to close the equation. So if theta is different from one, what happens? So if you do again Dinkin's formula and you try to find this discretization of the SPD, now you get this, you get all this bunch of terms. So as before, this term is, is good because it's the field applied in the Laplacian. Okay, we can control, it's, it's there. But these are the boundary terms. So let's just fix, for example, this left-hand side here, these two terms. Before, for theta equal to one, we could kill them by choosing the boundary conditions on the test function, right? We immediately kill this term and there was nothing to do. But here there is something extra to do because think for example about the Dirichlet case in which we only know that the test functions are zero at the boundaries and all the even derivatives are zero as well. So if this is true, so for example, you can convert this one age of one over n into one over n the gradient of h. And so somehow you kill this n three over two, uh, you kill it with a one over n. So you have square root of n over n theta. So this means that somehow I need to kill this term and this is the hard part because you are not in equilibrium, you are out of equilibrium. So in both cases, either theta less than one and theta bigger than one, we have to find a way to kill this term and this term because the boundary conditions don't immediately allow you to do that. So we can prove the following result, which is written here. So for example, theta less than one, you need to kill a square root of n and we can prove that the integral in time, so don't forget that this is in an integral in time in this formula, so the integral in time of the square root of n of eta one minus its mean is bounded by this. So if you put here a square root of n, you're gonna have an n times n theta over n square. So it's n theta over n, which goes to zero for theta less than one, okay? Okay, and for theta bigger than one, it's something similar. So this allows you to close the equations in Dinkin's formula, but correlations are much more complicated. So let me just try to go quickly and try to explain, okay, blah, 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 I go, I will go. How do we get this? Uh, okay, how do we prove this? Just, uh, just a, a little bit of uh, an idea of how do we prove this proposition? How do we prove that if you have this bound on the correlations at initial time, this is also true at any time t? So the idea is that you get an equation, a differential equation. Oops, it's here. The idea is that you get a differential equation for the correlation function. Okay, this is quite magical and very uh, restrictive because we are very lucky that the generator does not increase the degree. So if you think, for example, in weakly asymmetric, this doesn't work. But here, 
since it is sorry since since it here you have, since here you have a, a generator which does not increase the degree you are able to close the equation for the correlation function and write it in this way so you can see here an operator a and theta which is basically the two dimensional Laplacian on the triangle but in which you jump from the line, let's say, x equal to 1 to the line x equal to 0 with a rate 1 over n theta, OK? And it's a Laplacian on this triangle that I mentioned before. OK, I should draw and should make a drawing with my iPad. But imagine the triangle. So this is a two-dimensional Laplacian, <coughs> which, is, uh, in, which is reflected on the diagonal, on the upper diagonal, the line y equal to x plus 1. But if you want to jump from the line x equal to 1 to x equal to 0, the rate is 1 over n theta. And the same thing to go from uh, y equal to n minus 1 to one y equal to n. So knowing this, since you have this equation here, we can control the, I mean, we can get a bound for the correlation at time t by using Duhamel's formula. By what? By the initial condition that we impose, where we impose that initial correlations go to 0 plus an, uh, a correction term, plus an, an error term, let's say, which is given by this factor here. So if we are able to control the, deri the discrete derivatives of this profile, we are lucky and we can prove the result. OK, so basically, it's, it's more or less, OK, I don't want to enter into more details because I think I'm out of time. Um, OK, just one thing. I told you that stationary correlations, we can also prove the result. And the thing is that matrix and sats is very useful in now because if you want to show that the correlations satisfy whatever we ask, Matrix and SATS allows you, in fact, to compute them explicitly. And it's written here. You can see here the, ah, I think there was a question, no? Yeah, there, there is. Uh, sorry, I didn't see anything, oh, we, sorry. We, because we I, can do them when you're done. So. OK, sorry, I couldn't see them. I'm sorry. Uh, OK, after. OK, good. OK, just to say that matrix and SATS, it's very, very useful because, in fact, you can compute the correlations in hands. So you have this formula which I wrote here. And in fact, it was by looking at this formula that in fact, we could solve the case theta different from one. Because for theta different from one, okay, I'm not sure I can go back. I told you that there was a, uh, when you look at Tinkin's formula, you need to kill these terms. And at some point it seems impossible to kill these terms because you have a very big factor of N. But by looking at the correlations, because here you see when you square this guy here, if you, if you do, I mean, cauchy schwarz which is very bad. And if you try to get, uh, uh, if you really develop the square, you're going to have to control space-time correlation functions, but at the, at the same site, at the site one. And by looking at the stationary correlations from matrix and sets, we were able to see that, in fact, when you are looking at space-time correlation functions close to the boundary, they go to zero much faster than 1 over n. And this is what was a lot, what, what uh, I mean, what gave us the light to look at the, at this bound here to see that in fact we should be able to kill this term. Okay, I stop because there, were, there would be many other things to say, but just okay. I don't have even time to to talk about open problems. No, or I have. I think not. No, I don't. Now it's three. No. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking so much time. I wanted to say other things, but anyway, I think I really stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patricia. Everyone should be able to unmute themselves now and join together in some applause. Oops. And I'm going to pass this off to Alessandra, who will take care of the questions and then the next talk. So, Alessandra. Okay, so uh, uh, there are uh, two questions in the chat. So, the first question is the following. Um, if correlations tend to zero, then the limit of uh, the invariant measure has to be Bernoulli? If the correlations tend to zero, then the limit of invariant measure. Uh, you have a conditions about uh, correlations. Yes, yes, I have a condition the correlations, but uh, I don't understand the limit of the invariant, which invariant measure? The invariant measure of the system is not Bernoulli because the invariant measure of the system is, uh, it's not even product. But well, but your correlation will one over N, about one over N, for N tends to infinity, it will be zero. Yes, and the correlation, yes, the initial correlations when the system size goes to infinity, they go to zero. And at the time t also. Yes, and the time, at the time t, t also. T. Ah, but invariant does not. But in, 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 t, in t tends to infinity. Well, I don't understand. Ah, no, ah, no. 
no, 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 wait, wait, wait. So I start from a measure which is not invariant. It's, uh, it's not even product. I start from mm -hmm. a measure and I impose that the correlations at the initial time that go to zero when I take n to infinity. n and to infinity, is, yes. And, and not time n. You are uniformly in x and y. Uniformly in, in x and y, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't take time to, and then I say, if this is true at time zero, then this is true at time t. Mm -hmm. But the bound depends on t, so t is always in a compact space. Oh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so if mm -hmm. I take time to infinity, for example, in that bound for the correlation function, depending on t, then it blows up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. So there was also a question of uh, Gu, Chainlin Gu. Uh, it's on the chat, maybe. Uh, I, let me see. What, chain what is the is... answer. Uh, so what is the specific choice of the test function H? I suppose it refer, it is referred to the last uh, part. Yes, so there are three different cases. So depending on either it's Dirichlet, Robin or Neumann, I have three different space of test functions. So let me just probably share the screen again. Um, okay, here. So it depends. So let me just try to, yeah, it's here. So if it's, for example, the Robin case, which was the one I, I, I focused more was this, you ask that the test function has exactly the boundary conditions of the PDE of the homogeneous. So you take alpha equal to beta equal to zero, but you need to ask more. So in fact, when I, when I did Dinkins formula and I said, ah, if you take the, uh, the condition here with K equal to zero, you kill the term in Dinkins formula. But in fact, for uniqueness, you need to have this, um, how do you say this? This uh, this higher this higher uh, identity on the on the derivatives. So in fact, for Robin, you need that this identity is true for any k and this identity too. For Dirichlet, you need more than just saying that the function is zero at zero and one. You need all the even derivatives to satisfy that condition. And in Neumann, you need that the derivative is zero at zero and one, but all the all the derivatives also satisfy this condition. So this is a space of test functions in the three different uh, uh, regimes. I'm not okay. sure there is something else, sorry. Okay, uh, so the last question. So what about discrete time? Uh, so would, would the result be the same if you consider a discrete time Marco chain instead of working with continuous time? Oh, that I have no idea. That I have... A sequence of states it just a month, instead of continuous time, eta t. Uh, uh, okay, that, that I, I, I don't know. It's a good question. I have no idea. What would be the case? I, I don't know. So I have a, a, a question. Uh, so in your result, uh, at least uh, when you stated the result for theta equal to one, uh, you claim that there is tightness and uh, if uh, there is convergence, then you have a certain limit point. But can ah. you prove that uh, there is convergence, so the fluctuation field uh, converges? Sorry, Alessandra, I think you mean this result here, no? If I have convergence, yeah, yeah, that is... So there is this condition, if uh, it converges, but uh, can, yes, can you... Exactly. Can yes, you so... When uh, it converges, so give yes. us some conditions. Yes, so for example, if I don't know that it converges, the most general result that we can get is the one that I am showing you now. So I say that I have tightness and I know that the limiting point satisfy this identity here, but I don't know how to prove the convergence because I don't know how to prove that the points that the limiting points that satisfy these are in fact unique. I don't know how to prove uniqueness of this, of this mm -hmm. uh, solution. That I don't know, so I don't know convergence. But if I know the convergence at initial time, which is this next slide here, so okay. if I know that time, okay, okay. If I know that there is convergence at initial time, and this, for example, you can get if you take, for example, uh, mu n as the Bernoulli product measure with the profile rho zero, so that you can really compute by characteristic functions, you can compute that you have a limit, you have a, a limited, you have a limit at initial time. Then, in fact. The limit is the, I mean, it's tight, it converges, and the limiting process is a normal Stein Hulenbeck process. Okay, okay. Okay, it's so if you start from a Bernoulli product measure with some profile rho zero, which is not an invariant measure, then it's true again. Then the result is true. You get the convergence and the normal Stein Hulenbeck. Okay. 
So maybe it's uh, time to to stop because uh, okay, we have also the yes, next. <laughs> maybe stop for um, uh, some minutes. Uh, and uh, so let us first of all uh, thanks uh, um, Patricia again. Okay. So thanks a lot. Uh, maybe we, so Ivan has left for a moment. So the next speaker is uh, Cedric and uh, we can stop for three minutes. Okay, to start at the 10. Sorry, I took a long time. <laughs> okay, it happens. Yeah, Come we on. get excited and <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's, it's difficult to start from uh, the background, the basic background, and then arrive uh, to arrive uh, at the last uh, uh, results. Uh, so mostly yeah. Is, uh, so. yeah, it's very difficult. Oh, because... Okay, I think it has been useful. Uh, I, 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 so, Cedric. Uh, yes, I am here. Uh, so, you, uh, so if you want to upload your uh, slides, to share your slides, um, I yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I have, I'm not a host, so I, uh, maybe... Uh, you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a host. Maybe we need to wait uh, Ivan. So you... you but maybe I, I try, let me try. Uh, I think we see it. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So you... you so I am able to do it, yes. Okay, let's wait. Uh, so let us start at um, uh, 10, I said, so we have still one minute. And I will try to be shorter. So I've just uploaded uh, a link where uh, uh, people can download uh, the file of uh, Cedric uh, presentation. Okay, if you're interested, if it helps uh, to follow. Okay, so it is uh, for uh, 10, 10 past uh, four. Uh, so it is, uh, we can start, uh, Cedric, is it okay for you? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, yes. so okay. it's a pleasure to have uh, uh, Cedric Bernardin, a speaker for the second seminar about the uh, derivation of a couple KPZ burger equation from microscopic models. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so this is a joint work with, um, with uh, Sundar Sturaman from uh, Texan, Arizona and uh, uh, Tadai Satanaki from uh, Tokyo. And so in some sense, it is some continuation of uh, the talk of Patricia in the case where you have some weakly asymmetric system. So Patricia essentially um, was discussing some symmetric system. And, uh, but in my case, it will be at equilibrium. So in this case, I won't have this uh, strange uh, space of test functions. I will have some normal space of test function, but I will have some more exotic um, um, SPDs, since I will discuss some um, KPZ Burgers equation with multi component Burgers equation. Uh, so I think that everybody knows what is a KPZ equation, one dimensional KPZ equation. So it is uh, expected to be some universal object describing the evolution of some interface for a large class of uh, microscopic dynamics. So it is given, so H is uh, some function, more exactly it is a distribution depending on time and space, which uh, describes the evolution of the interface. 
So for example, here you have some, um, uh, some picture here and you see you have some interface which is here. And of course there is some limiting shape. And you, if you are interested in the uh, fluctuations of his, um, of his interface, then you, it will be it expected to be described by some phase universal e equation where you have some uh, diffusion term here and some nonlinear term, which is uh, the main problem to define the KPZ equation, uh, which, is, uh, proportion which is proportional to the square of the gradient of the interface. And uh, due to the fluctuations, you have also some white noise in space and time. In fact, I will not discuss so much KPZ equation, but something which is almost equivalent, which is Berger's equation, stochastic Berger's equation. So which, was, which will be abbreviated in the following by SPE, which is obtained from the KPZ equation by taking just the gradient of his equation. So if you define A is equal to the gradient of H, then you see that you get this stochastic Berger's equation in which um, just the nonlinearity, which before was uh, gradient of H square is replaced by the gradient of A square. Okay, just computation by it. Um, and in fact, they are almost equivalent. So just in the one dimensional case, because since you have A is equal to gradient of H, it's just a constant that you have to remove. Some infinite constant, in fact, but anyway. Um, so why I am interested more in stochastic Burgers equation than in KPC equation, just because in the context of uh, interacting particle system, uh, usually, at least in the interacting particle system I am interested in, you have some conserved quantity. And uh, so it is more natural to look at um, some conservative equation. And this Burgers equation, which appears in this context. But mainly if you have some interacting particle system like that, and if you define the interface created by this particle. You see you have some H that you can create in this way and this H is expected to converge uh, to this H uh, after some scaling limit. So in this talk, in fact, uh, uh, okay, I will not consider directly the stochastic Berger equation but some multi-content stochastic Berger equations that I will define a bit uh, later. So, but first uh, let me uh, review a bit what we know about uh, the KPZ or the stochastic Berger equation, in the case where you have only one component. So there is, there is a lot of work on these equations and uh, since uh, the Fields method of uh, Martin Eyre, so uh, a lot of people are working on these singular P, uh, SPDs. And you can attack uh, the problem from different point of view when you want to define what is the solution of some stochastic Berger equation of KPZ equation. So, or you can use the regularity structure theory of uh, Martin, but uh, there is also some alternatives like uh, the para control analysis of uh, Gubinelli and the co-authors, or something which has been less developed, which is as uh, this uh, method of Kupiainen based on the Wilson randomization group uh, method. In fact, in my talk, I will not so much interested in this um, existence, uniqueness of uh, solution of SPDs, of course, it is some ingredient which is necessary for my study, but uh, so what I want to discuss is more universality of this kind of, uh, of this kind of SPDs. And concerning the universality, what I mean here is that, um, in fact, it, is, uh, it has been shown and uh, that the stochastic Burgers equation is a universal object describing fluctuation of weakly asymmetric interacting particle system. So I will, um, I will explain a bit later what I mean by weakly asymmetry. But in particular, I want to discuss the strongly asymmetric system, only weakly asymmetric system, because it is for this weakly asymmetric system that we expect to add some, um, to belong to the KPZ, uh, KPZ equation universality class. And um, so up to now, um, a lot of work has been developed during the last year about this system, which are weakly asymmetric and which are conserving one quantity. For example, in the talk of Patricia, it was a dance. And to attack this problem, in fact, the first, uh, the first time it, was, uh, it has been attacked was uh, by um, Bertini and uh, Giacomin in 1907. And then uh, in this uh, paper, uh, they proved the convergence of the weakly asymmetric exclusion process to the call of solution of the, of the KPZ equation. And then, so during uh, many years, 
they didn't have any progress in this direction, but later some people, uh, so um, 20 years later, attacked the problem in different ways. And now we have some, a lot of technology to, to, dis, to develop this convergence of microscopic models, weakly asymmetric models, to the uh, KPZ or stochastic burger equation in the case where you have one concept quantity. So essentially, you have three kinds of methods. One is based, and it was uh, in the original paper of um, seminal paper of uh, Bertin and Jacobin, it was the microscop microscopic of uh, method. So you have some, in fact, the KPZ equation can be reduced by some uh, exponential transformation to some linear heat equation with multiplicative noise. And at the microscopic level, it was possible for the extrusion process to have some similar transformation. And so it was, um, it was by using this idea that they, de they derive the KPZ equation from some microscopic model. And some, um, some, uh, some studies have uh, continued uh, with this approach by, for example, by taking non-nearest neighbor um, exclusion process or taking system a bit outside of equilibrium, but uh, just a bit outside it is not completely outside of equilibrium. So this is the first approach. The second approach that I will um, speak more, and will talk more uh, during the, this talk is a multi-scale analysis. And in this multi-scale analysis, so I will come back to that, so I don't want to discuss so much. Uh, this is some interesting um, study because uh, some interesting method because it has some universal character. In the case of uh, the call of transform, it is a very uh, particular transform which exists only for a few models. For example, the extrusion process, but if you try to take for a zero range process, for example, you don't have this call of uh, transform, microscopic, microscopic call of transform, and this multi-scale analysis is more robust to the details of the models. And in particular, in principle, it should be apl applicable to a very, very large class of models. And some third kind of method are based on some kind of stochastic integrability or, um, or duality uh, properties of microscopic system. So it, many, I think that is uh, the three big method in order to derive uh, the KPZ equation or stochastic Berger's equation from a microscopic model. And uh, I, so each method is have the advantages and disadvantages. So the problem of these two methods, which are here, is that they are not robust to the details of the model. If you change a bit the model, then you destroy these integrability properties of this microscopic color transform. These ones, multi-scale analysis, it's much more robust. On the other hand, these uh, stochastic integrability method are very powerful because they permit also to study strongly asymmetric system, which for the moment this method is not able to say nothing about this case. And everything that we know for the strongly asymmetric system, in particular, the KPZ fixed point properties is, uh, is coming from this, uh, from this kind of, uh, of techniques. But me in this talk, I will, be, um, I will use this uh, kind of approach, which is on multi-scale analysis. Okay, so this is uh, just uh, some review of what we know for uh, the case of um, a system with one conserved quantity. And now it is a natural question to ask what happens in the case where you have some weakly interacting particle system which conserve much more than one conserved quantity. So what, what is the kind of universality classes that you can expect? What are the SPDEs which will describe the fluctuations? of these uh, conserved quantities. So what we, we could try naively, what we could expect is that you have some uh, multi-component TPZ equation, which should appear in the limit of this kind of interacting particle system. So, and uh, so the first question before to attack the problem is, are the multi-component KPZ equations well-defined? And the answer is a yes with this, uh, this theory, if it's, uh, theory of uh, paracontrol analysis or uh, regulatory structures, at least if you are in some compact space, there are no problem to define multi-component KPZ equations. So this is something which is 
known, which is done. And now it's uh, something which is not known, not done. Uh, and I think it is the first time that we are able to derive some multi-component KPZ equations uh, from a, a scaling limit of some interacting particle system. And this is the question that I will address in this talk. I will present some model for which we can derive this multi-component KPZ equation starting from uh, um, some interacting particle system. And some questions that I don't know, I think it is, the answer is no, is our multi-component KPZ equation universal object in some sense that will precise at the end of the, of the talk. So the, my goal now is to uh, present some model and to present also the method of uh, multi-scale analysis in order to derive uh, the, uh, the multi-component KPZ equation from some interacting particle system. And uh, since, in fact, this, uh, this is quite technical, uh, I would present the method not for the multi-spaces uh, zero-range process, but first I will present it for the usual model, which was uh, initially for just one, the one component KPZ equation, just for some pedagogical uh, aspects. So the model, the microscopic model that I consider first, which is not multi, uh, which will not give in the limit the multi-component KPZ equation, but which will give in the limit the KPZ equation, the usual KPZ, or more exactly the usual stochastic, stochastic Berger equation with one component, is a zero-range process that uh, Patricia presented before. And in the weakly asymmetric case, so I will present the method of the multi-scale analysis in this case. And then I will say that we can use this method in order to prove the theorem that we present at the end for the multi-component uh, KPZ equation. So for the moment, I start with the zero-range process. Um, so zero-range process is some um, uh, interacting particle system. So here I am on the torus, a discrete uh, time torus, a discrete torus, sorry. So with n, uh, n sides, okay. And uh, on each side, you have some, um, some certain number of particles, for example, three here, two here. And uh, so it is a Markov process. On each uh, side, uh, you have some number of particles and we denote by alpha Tx, the number of particles that you have on site X at time T. And then uh, the dynamic is as follows. You have some exponential clocks and when a clock ring, then the particle, one particle on the, on, the, on the site X, for example, if the clocks of the, of the site X uh, is ringing, try to jump, jumps, sorry, jumps to uh, some other site, Y. And what is the rate of the jump? The rate of the jump is given by uh, the product of two terms. So there is Pn Y minus X, so, here in this case, I would consider only the nearest neighbor case. It is not so important, but it is uh, easier to, uh, to present for the presentation. So this is uh, the probability to jump from Y to X, and it is multiplied by uh, some rate, which is G of alpha X, which represents the num uh, which, is, um, which is a function of the number of particles that you have on the site X. Okay, so it is exactly the same notation that we add in the in Patricia's talk, but in my case, this, um, this uh, probability, this transition probability here will depend on the uh, scaling parameter n, which is the number of sides. At the end, I will send n to infinity. So here you see that because of this term, which is uh, C divided by n power gamma, so gamma here is some uh, positive parameter, and um, this uh, parameter will be a responsible of the asymmetry of the system. So if you imagine some, some, some random work with this uh, probability to jump from to the right or to the left, you see that as soon as C is different from zero, you have some asymmetric, um, asymmetric random work. So you will have some drift because of this term here, you will have some drift of the particle to, to some direction. And the drift is, regularity, is regulated by, um, it is, a weak, weak drift because here n will go to infinity 
and the intensity of the asymmetry is c divided by n power gamma, so which goes to zero as uh, n goes to infinity, uh, at least if gamma is strictly positive. Okay, if gamma equal to zero, it corresponds to the strongly asymmetric case. So I will discuss only the case where gamma is strictly positive, and in fact, only the case where gamma is bigger or equal to one half. So you have some weak asymmetry. Uh, so this system is um, some well-defined interacting particle system. Of course, you have to impose some condition on the function G, which appears here, but it is well-defined. And it has the property to have only one conserved quantity, which is the total number of particles on the system. So here, at the opposite of uh, Patricia, I don't have any uh, boundary terms, some reservoirs creating or destroying particles. I am on the terms, everything is periodic, the number of particles is conserved by the dynamics. And so it will be the difference later, if that here you have only one conserved quantities, later we will have um, more than only one. And so, of course, uh, since uh, there is uh, some um, number of particles is conserved, the system is not ergodic because you have some invariant uh, functions, some invariant function for the system. And so you have some, uh, the, the stationary measure of the system uh, will not be unique. In fact, you can show that you have some one parameter family of invariant measures, which, is, which are product. So I didn't write, yes, sorry. I didn't write that they are product. So it is a nice property of this uh, zero range model, they are product. And in fact, they are uh, indexed by some parameter phi, which is called usually the chemical potential. Um, and so this phi is some uh, uh, positive number. And here, just to precise notation, uh, G of K uh, factorial, it's just what you think, G of K, G of K minus one, it's the G of one. Okay, and so you can show that these invariant measures are invariant for the, for the range process. So Z of phi is just uh, some normalization function. And in the rest, I will denote by A, the mean density of the um, Z-range process under this equilibrium measure, mu bar phi. So A of phi is a function of phi, which represents the density of particle under this stationary measure. And uh, in fact, we can show that the application which to phi associate A of phi is one to one. So instead to index the stationary measure by phi, it is more natural, in fact, to, um, to, to parameterize this measure by the uh, density. And so I will denote new A, so this, um, this one parameter family of invariant measure, but instead to parameterize by phi, I will parameterize by A, where A is some positive number, which represents the density of the particle. So in particular, you have that expectation under new A of alpha X or any X is equal to A. Okay, it is an average density in the system. So it is an invariant measure, the equilibrium measure, and I will always consider my system at equilibrium, which is the main difference with what uh, presented uh, Patricia. So um, for non-equilibrium, there are not so many works which are done in particular in the in the weakly asymmetric case. So now, uh, so it is what I said before, I uh, consider my system at equilibrium. So I start with the initial configuration at time zero, which is distributed according to some uh, stationary measure with some mean density, which is A. And I define um, the equilibrium fluctuation field and this equilibrium fluctuation field is some distribution valued process, which is defined as it was in the talk of Patricia uh, by this formula. So here, um, so T is just uh, the, the one dimensional torus, the, the continuous one dimensional torus. And D prime of T is a set of distribution of his uh, torus. And you see here, YTN is just a sum of direct mass at is a linear combination of Dirac mass at uh, point X over N. So it is a distribution which is random because here you have as a configuration of your Markov process at time T N square. 
So T n square, it means that I will look at the system in the diffusive time scale. Okay, I'm in fact here because I'm taking x over n, it means that I perform some uh, scaling in space and this multiplication of the time by n square, it means that I'm, uh, I look at the system in a very long time scale, which is a diffusive time scale. So this is the main object that I will uh, would like to study and this is this object which should converge as n goes to infinity under some conditions to uh, the uh, stochastic Berger equation, the solution of the stochastic Berger equation at equilibrium because I'm starting at equilibrium. So what, he, what it is, you see here, you have just, uh, since you start at equilibrium for at any time t, you have that expectation uh, starting from new a of alpha t n square x is always equal to a. And so I'm looking at the, 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 the real uh, number of particles at time t n square on the side x minus its average. And I divide by one over square root of n, which is the scaling of the, of the, of the central limit theorem. And I will ask what is the limit of this guy as n goes to infinity. So if uh, you don't like with the Dirac mass, you can see its action on smooth function h and just given by his uh, expression, which is here. So in particular, you can um, check easily that since you are at equilibrium here, it means that in law, this guy is the same as the guy at, lo, uh, at time zero, it has the same law. And then by the central limit theorem, when, because here you have, if y zero and h, it just, um, so the sum of independent random variable, okay, here at any time t, the alpha t n square x are independent random variables and you fix the time. Okay, so you have some correlation in time, but in space, if you fix the times, they are not correlated. And then it converges to, um, uh, it by the central limit theorem, it converges to um, the white noise apply to the function h and multiply by the variance and the new a of uh, alpha x. Oh, sorry, to some white noise in space, okay? So in fact, what I know is that if there is a limit, the limit has to be uh, at any time, it has to be equal to a white noise in space. Okay, let me start first in the case where you have a very, uh, very uh, weak asymmetry. So I recall you that the asymmetry in the system was regulated by some parameter which was C divided by n power gamma. So it means that if gamma is very large, for example, you can imagine gamma going to infinity, which would correspond also to C equal to zero, then it means that you don't have asymmetry. You have some kind of symmetric, symmetric uh, zero range process. And so in this case, um, it is uh, not so um, difficult. I will present uh, some ideas of the proof to show that this fluctuation field converges to some, uh, the solution of some stochastic partial differential equation, which is if gamma is bigger, strictly bigger than one, so it means the, 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 the asymmetry is very, very weak. Okay, the symmetry is here because n goes to infinity it would converge to some linear equation, which is just some Ostenbeck process, infinite dimensional Ostenbeck process, and in fact, stationary. Uh, because as I told you, it is at any time t, y t is distributed like uh, white noise, space white noise, which is a stationary solution of his Ostenbeck process. Then you can increase a bit as the, as the asymmetry and then something happens when the asymmetry becomes uh, of order C divided by N. Okay, when gamma is equal to one, so it means that you have some asymmetry of order one over N and then the limit is a bit different because you have some new term which appears, which is a drift in the Ostenbeck equation. And uh, then, um, okay, that is known since a long time, maybe, uh, yes, since uh, something like 84, I think. Um, and um, of course, you don't have any problem for the SPD, which appears because it is just a linear equation. 
and uh, you can you have a uniqueness existence of uniqueness of his uh, of his uh, solution of his equation. In fact, in the in the order to derive his uh, his equation, what we need is a Martingale formulation of his SPDs. But uh, so so some techniques were developed since uh, the work of Ole and Struve. So it is what happens in the case where gamma is uh, bigger or equal to one. And then I will show you what are the main ingredients to derive uh, this, uh, this case, where we will see the drift, the drift appearing. So the proof in the case gamma equal to one. So what you do is uh, what Patricia did before, it is always the starting point. You write the Dinkins formula or Ito's formula, if you prefer, for the fluctuation field. You write it, you, you perform some integration by parts and so on, and you get this exact formula. Here there are no approximation, where um, you have um, three terms. And so there is a term which is here, which is just a Martingale term. And this Martingale term will be responsible of the white noise which appears in the, in the stochastic Burger equation. Why it is a white noise? So it is some simple computation. Since you are at equilibrium, it is not difficult, in fact, to make some exact computation. You, you know the invariant measures are known, they are products, so it is not uh, difficult to do it. And you get that this, um, the quadratic variation of this Martingale is proportional to t and with uh, some constant which is equal to that. So you need a bit more, but it should be uh, by the Levy theorem, it should convince yourself that this Martingale would converge to this uh, derivative of the white noise um, multiplied by this constant, uh, square root of g tilde a. So I don't know if I said what was g tilde a. g tilde a is the expectation under the invariant measure nu a of the g of alpha x. So G was the guy which was appearing in the definition of the rates of the range process. So the average value under the invent measure nu a, at density a, of this uh, G of alpha x function. So this problem is, uh, this, uh, this term is, uh, is easy to treat. And then you have the two other terms which are here. And if you look at these two other terms, they have the form of the fluctuation field that I defined before because you have the square root of n, which is here. The problem here is that you have something which is not, uh, which is not similar to what you have in YTNH. In YTNH, if you remember the definition of YTNH, it was alpha, alpha TN square X minus A. And now, it is what appears is some fluctuation field, but not of the quantity alpha, which is conserved, but on the non-conserved quantity G of alpha. Okay, but otherwise they have the same form in particular, the, the square root of N is, um, is present in this case. And here's the main ingredient to what you want to do is at the end, you want to have some Martingale formulation of uh, your uh, equation of your S limiting SPD. So what you would like is to express these two, uh, these two terms in terms of the initial fluctuation field YN. So you have in some uh, sense to uh, replace this, this, um, this term here and this term here by something which is, uh, which is in terms of the YN, in terms of the fluctuation field. And this is done thanks to the first order, uh, first order Boltzmann-Gibbs principle, uh, which was in fact, okay, it was uh, derived for the first time in 84 by uh, Brooks and Ross by some method which are different from the method that we use now. Um, and uh, so it is the main ingredient in the, in the, to close the equation, to close the evolution. So what is this first uh, Boltzmann-Gibbs principle? I won't give the proof because it is very long, but the main idea is that, in fact, it tells you that um, you, have, you have that, you see the limit here on the L2 norm of his difference. So here, the guy with his, with his term here is a guy which appears uh, in the previous slide. 
So in one case, it was with some a gradient of H, and in the other case, it was with a um, Laplacian of H. And what you do is that you take the difference with some linearization of this term along the field of the conserved quantities. Alpha X minus A, it is a conserved quantity of system. So in some sense, you project the fluctuation field of a non-conserved quantities, which is this guy here, you project it into uh, the, onto the, um, the fluctuation field of the conserved quantity. And the, the value of the, in front of the projection is given by the first, by the derivative at, uh, at, um, at density A of the function G tilde. So I recall you that G tilde A is the expectation under the equilibrium measure new A of G of eta X, uh, G of alpha X. So mainly it is some kind of Taylor expansion at first order. Okay, but the idea is that you have some non-conserved quantity, which is G of alpha X, which fluctuates. And in fact, in the limit, what is important is its component on the, on the conserved quantity, because the conserved quantity fluctuates, fluctuates less because it is conserved. And then when you do that, if you assume that his uh, first order, first order Boltzmann gives principle holds, then you can close the equation uh, that we had before, because you have just to replace his, uh, the two terms, which were um, phase one and phase one, you can uh, replace them by some um, constant times the initial fluctuation field. So you have some uh, closed equation. You have to prove tightness of his yn in order to, uh, to have some, some, some uh, sub subsequence converging. Then his subsequent will solve some Martingale problem. If you have uniqueness of the Martingale problem, then you are done. You say that all the limiting points are concentrated on the solution of his uh, Martingale problem for the stochastic Burger equation. And it is in this way that you derive uh, phys, uh, phys limiting object. You see, there are exactly the two. Um, we had the Martingale term, which, were pro which was producing, um, which was producing this term. And then here you have the C, which was due to the asymmetry, on, um, which was the second term, and this one was the, the first term with the Laplacian of H. Okay. Okay, that was in the case gamma equal to one, the case gamma bigger, strictly bigger than one. What you can imagine is like if you replace, if you had to replace the constant C here by um, one over N gamma minus one, something like that. And so it will disappear in, um, in the limit. And so that you will have the Hirschenbeck process, but without any drift. Okay. So I don't uh, detail how you, you get this first order Boltzmann gives principle. It is based on uh, some many things, but um, the main ingredients are some spectral gap, the equivalence of ensembles for these uh, uh, equilibrium measures, some Kipnis varied and estimate, and some uh, multiscale argument. Okay, so now you can try to increase the symmetry by uh, uh, by uh, letting decreasing as uh, letting decrease as uh, the gamma okay when gamma is large it means that you have some weak asymmetry when gamma is going more to zero it means that you have a uh, stronger asymmetry and if you think if you remember what is the form of the asymmetry it was c divided by n power gap and so the equation that i obtained before was c over n. So c over n gamma, you can see it like c over n multiply. So here I consider only the case gamma equal one half. So it is one half here. So it is square root of n c over n. So roughly speaking, it means that in the previous equations that we had, which was this one, we have to send c to infinity because that you can write it like square root of n c divided by n. So it is some kind of C tilde divided by n. So I come back to the case that I treated before when gamma is equal to one, but with now C tilde, which is square root of nc. So it means that it has to be very large. 
and uh, so if you look at this equation, you try to send c to infinity, it seems uh, impossible to, to get some limit. And uh, so what you have to do in order to see some limit in the case gamma equal one half um, is uh, to, um, to change a frame to see something. To see some limit, you have to change a frame. So what does it mean? That instead of uh, considering the initial fluctuation field that I defined before, I consider the new field, new fluctuation field, which is similar with the diffusive time scale here with the one over square root of n um, uh, scaling in space, but here I remove, I remove some, uh, I put some shift in space, which is given by uh, this quantity here. So here you see you have some t, okay? So it means that you are looking at your fluctuation field, but in a frame moving with this velocity. And from a more physical point of view, it is quite natural in fact, because if you imagine that this equation is valid, it means that here you have some transport term and you want to study the fluctuations of, uh, of uh, this, uh, this, uh, this guy when you have some transport, which is very strong. So this transport, it is like if you were in a plane and you add some your um, cup of coffee and you want to study the heat diffusion inside your uh, cup of coffee. If you are in the plane and if you are, if you are looking at the heat diffusion of your uh, coffee, of cup of coffee from the earth, you will see nothing. You will see just some ballistic transport of energy. You have to be in the plane in order to see the diffusion of the, of the heat in your cup of coffee. Okay, so it is exactly the same principle. You have to change a frame in order to see some limit in this case. Before you didn't have to do it because the, the velocity was sufficiently for, uh, small in order to not have to change a frame. But now the, the velocity is increasing and you have to remove it in order to see the, some limit. So now we use this new, um, new uh, density field and uh, we try to repeat exactly the same uh, computation as before. We write the Dinkins formula. It takes now this, the following form. So what is the difference with what we had before when um, gamma was equal to one? So the main difference is that when gamma was equal to one, we didn't have this term. It was not present. It appears because we remove, um, we change the frame. It is the reason for which it appears. But now there is a bad news is that in front of his sum over X, it is not of order one over square root of n, which was the case in the, um, in the case in when gamma was equal to one. But now since the asymmetry is uh, stronger, you have no terms in front of it. So in particular, if you look at this guy and you try to make some static estimate of the guy, you see that it blows up. So it is only because there are some uh, correlation in time that this guy could uh, become uh, smaller and in fact would become of order one. And what you see here, uh, you see something which looks like some, um, some uh, Taylor expansion of uh, the function G of alpha in some, in some kind of Taylor expansion. But what is missing is this one was called of n. And if uh, you think about uh, the, fir the first order Boltzmann Gibbs principles that I showed you before, with the one was called of n in front of this guy, you know that this will go to zero. So it means that this guy by the first order, um, the first order um, uh, Boltzmann Gibbs principle, it is at least of order square root of n. And in fact, we'll see that it is of order one, not square root of n, it is smaller. But this, uh, it is small because of, you will take the interval in time. Uh, so I have just to precise maybe some uh, notations. Um, so if you define this function V of alpha X, which is a function which appears in this term, which is a problematic term, then you see that V tilde, so as usual V tilde is the expectation under the, priority me uh, the, under the equilibrium measure of V of alpha X. You see that of course, its value at A is zero and its first derivative at A is equal to zero. And then, in order to, to, 
to close this equation, you cannot just rely on the first order, um, first order uh, Boltzmann Gibbs principle. You have to uh, define the second order Boltzmann Gibbs principle. So this second order Boltzmann Gibbs principle was introduced by um, by um, Patricia and Milton. So uh, you know, few, five, five, six years ago. No, more than that, maybe. Uh, yes, seven, seven years ago, I think. And it permits, in fact, to close the equation. So what is this a second order Boltzmann Gibbs principle? So basically, the ingredients to derive the second order Boltzmann Gibbs principle are the same as the ingredients which are used for the first order Boltzmann Gibbs principle. So technically, there are not some special difficulties to, to do it. But the idea to, to think of the second order Boltzmann Gibbs principle was a great idea. So what we do, in fact, we claim that um, now the terms that we have with this uh, V of alpha Sx, uh, sorry, I forgot some n square here. It is in the diffusive time scale. We say that it is close to the second derivative of the function V tilde multiplied by this uh, quantity. So what is this quantity? So this quantity when here, it is L, it is like some kind of empirical density of the, the conserved quantity in a box of size L. You take the square and you subtract this term, which is a small term because it is of order one over L. So mainly this is this guy. So it is some kind of second order Taylor expansion of this guy. So the first term, the first linear, um, the first order Boltzmann Gibbs principle was just to project onto the fluctuation field of the conserved quantity. And now appear some quadratic term. This quadratic term, um, if you rewrite it, when you write the quantity we are interested in and you replace this L, which is here by epsilon N, as it is here, then you see that it is it can be expressed as um, a function of the fluctuation field. A function of the fluctuation field, but, um, but on this very singular object, because it is on some function, which is a yota epsilon, which macroscopically, when epsilon goes to zero, approximates some Dirac mass. And this is this term, which will be responsible in the limit of the term, which appears in the, in the Burger's equation, which was gradient of a square. Okay, here you get the square, and uh, the gradient is here on the test function by, by integration by parts. It will appear at the end on the a on the on the a square in the Burger's equation. So here the idea will be to send first n to infinity and then epsilon to zero. The problem is that when you send n to infinity and then epsilon to zero, you are not sure that this guy will converge to something. And a priori, this converge also to some distribution for which you take the square. Okay, but it gives you the idea of what should be the way to define some uh, Martingale solution of the stochastic Burgers equation. So here it is was the concept of energy solution of stochastic Burgers equation, which was developed by um, Patricia and Milton. So you have to first you have to impose. Um, Okay, I define what I called the energy condition. So if you have some um, process, which is distribution valued process, we say that it satisfies the energy condition if you have this uh, guy, which is here, which is very similar to the guy that appeared in the second order Boltzmann Gibbs principle, um, which exists by some, um, uh, by some um, argument of Cauchy seconds. So you define this guy, which is well defined, okay? Because here, even if y is some distribution, you apply it to some function. So you get just a number, you take the square. So this at epsilon at epsilon fixed is well defined. But then you have to prove that in fact, it is a Cauchy seconds as epsilon goes to zero. So you don't know exactly what is the limit of this guy, but you say that the limit exists because it is a Cauchy sequence. And then what uh, uh, Patricia and Milton define as a stationary uh, energy solution of the stochastic Burger equation, 
which is I recall here, here is a stochastic process with which is distribution valued such that at any time yt is a centered spaced white noise. So it is what I explained you uh, before at the beginning because it is what we expect since we are at equilibrium and satisfying the energy condition because it is um, some condition like that that you need in order to close the equation. You need that the guy which appeared previously here uh, has to converge as epsilon goes to zero. When n goes to infinity, the convergence is, uh, is uh, obtained by some tightness argument. But then when epsilon goes to zero, you need some extra argument. And so the, the notion of uh, Martingale solution for the stochastic burger equation is that we impose that it satisfies the, the it satisfy, um, the Martingale formulation, where here you just replace the, the problematic term, which was that I would like to write um, uh, I would like to write y s of gradient of h square, something like that, but I cannot do it. So I replace it by a t h, and the existence of the a t h is provided because we say that it satisfies the energy condition. So by some Cauchy argument, and we say that it's a Martingale with quadratic variation equal to that, in order to say by the Levy theorem that it is just um, the derivative of some uh, space-time white noise. Okay, so this is a concept of uh, energy solution, which was introduced by uh, Patricia and Milton, but which has some default, which is that we don't know um, how to prove uh, uniqueness for this kind of uh, of stochastic for this kind of stationary energy solution. And uh, but then, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, Perkovsky and uh, Gubinelli uh, arrived a few years later and prove that in order to restore the uniqueness of his uh, Martingale formulation, we are just to add the fact that the backward in time, uh, backward in time uh, uh, solution is also some energy solution. For the microscopic system, it is very easy to, if you have some energy solution, it is very easy to, to show that the backward in time is also some energy solution. You are just to reverse the drift. So in fact, this uh, condition is trivial to, to, check, um, to check at the microscopic level if you have um, proved that it is some energy solution. And uh, with these two ingredients, you have some, um, some uniqueness which is restored. And thanks to this, uh, okay, I have to go fast because I still didn't present uh, my result. Um, so with this, uh, this uh, model, um, these uh, two results, in fact, we have some robust method in order to show um, to show um, existence of uniqueness of um, of uh, the KPZ equation as scaling limit of uh, a large class of interacting particle system which are weakly interacting. So now I'm going to the results that we proved with uh, Funaki and, uh, and uh, uh, Sunders to Raman which is the application of this method in the case where you have some system with mul several spaces. And so the system that we considered was the zero range process with uh, several corals. So on each side X now, you have, um, you have uh, different types of uh, particles, say corals, and each particle we jump from X to X plus one with some rate which would be which would depend on the particle i and would depend on some drift. And we assume that the drift is the same for all the particles, c divided by square root of n, so it is a critical, uh, critical scaling. And we also impose several conditions in order to be able to use this technology of uh, the second order Boltzmann Gibbs principle, spectral gap, uh, equivalence of ensembles, and so on. And so it is very similar to, to what we did uh, before. And uh, we define now some, um, some fluctuation field for each um, kind of particle i. We start again with the process at equilibrium, okay? But now the invariant measures are indexed by uh, some vector in Rn. 
the A here is in Rn because you have N kind of particles. So each density of um, a density for each particle, for each kind of particle. And you define this fluctuation field where as before you have to look at it in some frame. And I insist on the fact that the frame is the same for all the particles. So you remove some uh, velocity here, but the velocity is the same for each particle. It doesn't depend on the particle, on the, on the kind of particle. And then we can prove the, we prove the, following, uh, the following theorem, which says that if some frame condition is realized, so I will precise what is a frame condition, then the fluctuation field Yin converge as n goes to infinity to the unique stationary energy solution of the multi-component stochastic Burgers equation. So it is a multi-component stochastic Burgers equation that you could expect. You have some quadratic terms uh, where uh, you have some um, cross term involving a uh, different fluctuation field of different kind of particles. So you have some non-linearity which is present here. Okay, but in order to derive this uh, condition, we impose a frame condition. The frame condition is that, in fact, we have all this quantity, the derivative respect to AI, AI is the density of the particle I of the G tilde IA, G tilde IA is just as before, the expectation under the equilibrium measure nu A of G of alpha, GI of alpha X. We impose that this condition holds. Okay, so that we can remove, we can looking at all the fluctuation field in the same frame. So this is an important ingredient, which is a crucial ingredient in order to derive this, uh, this result. Otherwise, if we don't have this frame condition, we don't know what to do. And, um, okay, sorry, uh, just um, to say, uh, so there is some existing, and some, uh, some theorem of existence of uniqueness of uh, Martingale solution of these multi-component KPZ equations. So that is not a problem. So we can uh, show that it converges to this, uh, to this guy. The only problem that you can see in this case is that maybe, maybe by, imposing this, by imposing this frame condition, maybe we get, um, we get a limit which is trivial in the sense that, for example, Maybe all these terms are zero. Or maybe you can transform your uh, multi-component KPZ equation by performing some transformation in order to not have some interactions between the, the different fluctuation field. That you could imagine that it would be possible because here we impose some uh, frame condition, we impose some rigidity in the transition rates. But we can show, um, that the previous theorem is not empty in the sense that there exists some density parameter for some special uh, models for which the frame condition holds and for which the stochastic Burgers equation cannot be decoupled. Of course, I would have to precise what, uh, what means the possibility to decouple equation, what we have some definition, and we can show that it is not possible to do it. So you have really some interacting KPZ equation. So here it is a formal definition, but I don't have time to discuss that. And just to conclude, I would like to say that um, one question is what happens if you don't have the, the frame condition? If you don't have the frame condition, if you try to repeat the same thing, you will have to consider terms like that. Terms like that means that you have some correlation between the fluctuation field of the particle I and the fluctuation field of the particle J evaluated at this approximation of Dirac mass at X over N, this iota, um, epsilon x over n, which is mainly delta at x over n, this function delta of x over n, in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. But here you have also this same Dirac mass, but which is a big drift. Because in, you don't have the same frame condition, means that each fluctuation field at its own velocity. And here c is the difference of velocity between the um, the spacey I and uh, the, the particle of, um, of, uh, of label J. So you have the difference of velocity. So it means that here, this guy will diverge as n goes to infinity. And maybe we can expect that it goes to zero 
but that I'm not totally sure. And this is the main problem for which we have to impose this frame condition. If we don't have this frame condition, in fact, I don't know what happens with uh, these terms, even heuristically. Um, okay, so I think that I will, um, I will uh, conclude now. I'm sorry because I said that would be short and I was also long. <laughs> okay, sorry. thanks a lot. Uh, so Ivan, I do not, uh, do not know, um, okay, he's not uh, present, he has a problem. Uh, Tom, so I, I cannot unmute all people. I hope uh, that uh, uh, people can unmute uh, themselves, uh, I hope, uh, to I thank- It's uh, now for, uh, I'm back. Okay. It says yeah. so people can unmute themselves. There are three dots next to unmute all. Okay, thanks. So let us thank uh, Sergei Dick. So, um, so if uh, so, there is uh, no question in the chat. But if uh, somebody, if anybody has a question, so. Well, I had a question actually. So um, th there was some recent work of Kevin Yang, a student from Stanford using, I guess, Hopf-Cold approved uh, long range universality. It, how does this, com you know, the, the techniques there, how does this compare to the microscopic or, you know, the multi-scale analysis techniques? Uh, uh, so I don't know if his paper, what, what is the techniques oh, of uh, his paper? Let, you know, I'll send you the, I'll send the link. Um, he's actually done a few nice papers. Uh, one was, uh, one was with uh, finite range exclusion and one is, uh, the same thing, but on, um, on, on like zero to N with different boundary conditions. He's kind of, he's furthered this um, Dembo uh, Psi result. But uh, w w when it is long range, it means that it is uh, finite variance or infinite variance? Uh, no, no, I think finite variance, but, but you know, arbitrary jump distributions. Uh, okay, okay. So, but it is by using physical op uh, transform, yes? Yeah, and, and then some hydrodynamic theory on top of it. Okay, uh, so... Uh, anyway, it might be more interesting to look at. It's good work, I think. And, uh, okay, yes. Okay, I didn't know this paper, but it is uh, some prolongation of the paper of, um, of uh, Dembo, maybe, and its uh, student. I think it kind of starts off in a similar way, but then it, it, it's able to break away. You know, there were some severe restrictions there about the mm -hmm. type of jumps and it's able to do okay. basically arbitrary jump distribution. Yes, okay, so in his, uh, in his uh, talk, I just presented the case where you have uh, a nearest neighbor, um, nearest neighbor, but in fact, it, it can be generalized to finite trans um, uh, interactions. The only thing is that the, for, um, the problem is outside of equilibrium, this method is not robust. Not totally robust. It can be. You can do something like it was presented in uh, Patricia, but you need some control of correlations and so on that really we don't know how to do. So this this is really limited to the stationary case. Okay, I have a question. Please, okay, short. Uh, so you have discussed the case gamma larger than or equal to one, and then gamma one alpha, but uh, what about uh, gamma smaller than one and different uh, from one alpha? Uh, yes, so yes, I didn't do it, I uh, didn't say it, but in the case where gamma is between one alpha and one, uh, so where is it? Yes, in fact, what you have to do is uh, if you between one alpha and one, you have to remove, you have to change a frame and then you will converge to the um, Ochstein windbeck without any drift. Mm -hmm. So between up to one half, in fact, by removing, uh, before, um, before one, I didn't, uh, for gamma strictly bigger than one, I didn't have to remove any drift. For gamma equal to one, I have to remove some uh, drift. For gamma between one and one half, you have also to remove some drift, but then the limit is still uh, linear. You don't have some, uh, some stochastic barrier equation. It is only for gamma equal one half that appears some uh, quadratic term. And smaller than one half? Uh, uh, smaller than one half, it is uh, yeah. KPZ fixed point and, um, and for which these techniques don't work, but for which there are some results by, uh, by all these um, stochastic interoperabilities that, uh, okay that Corwin can discuss a lot, 
where they can they can do they can say they can say something. So for gamma less than one half, it is mainly the asymmetric exclusion process. So the fluctuations are very different. Um, okay. So thanks. So I think uh, so. If there are uh, there is no other question, we can uh, thank again uh, Cedric and Patricia for their nice uh, talks, and uh, we will uh, meet again next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye to everybody. Bye bye. bye. So Ama Amanda, I think we can discuss uh, here in Zoom or should we? Maybe we should make a separate Zoom meeting, do you think? Okay, okay. so I, I greet everybody. <laughs> and uh, okay, anyway, I cannot uh, close uh, the, the meeting. I don't have- uh... I, think, I think you're a host now, actually. I think you can. I am, the, the, okay, so I close. So goodbye to everybody. Have a nice evening. Or anyway, rest of the day. Bye bye. Okay, and then um, Alessandra. Yes. Will you send me a separate link, or how do you want to do this? I can send you a separate link. Okay, great. All right, I'll chat to you soon then. Okay. <laughs>